Hi, everyone. Just before we get going, I want to remind you that everything we talk about and discuss should not be considered as investment advice. The purpose of what we talk about on Catherine Murray Media and Markets on YouTube, as well as Catherine Murray in conversation with on my podcast, should be viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Please definitely do your own research, your own homework, and definitely consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions. And also to note, some of us might hold positions in some of the stocks uh, that we discuss. Uh, Peter, great to be able to catch up with you and get your views. Certainly so many of my viewers over the past decade know you, (laughs) as well as many, many investors having been a Wall Street and Bay Street uh, tech analyst, and now of course, for the past number of years, uh, a VC tech investor. Uh, So welcome and thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, And I want to first get your take in terms of when we step back and think about technology, obviously working from home, we all know, you know, even more so the importance of how it's influencing us. But you say that there is, in fact, of course, a structural and societal change going on that will impact uh, the amount of tech in our lives. Um, What do you mean by that? And where do you see this really having an impact? What's a fascinating uh, takeaway from the pandemic that we've all gone through and the entire planet's experienced is that it created a massive dislocation across almost every industry, across almost every facet of life. And it forced us to embrace technology at a pace and a rate and in a broad spectrum of, of ways that would have taken 10 plus years to happen before. And we slammed it into a year And what that has then created is this inertia, destroyed the inertia and created this momentum uh, of adoption across verticals, across industries and fundamentally changed behavior. And that fundamental behavior change means that we're no longer going to tolerate the idea of going into a bank, as an example, to do our banking in person. We may wanna do that for novelty. We may wanna do that to, to get a hug or to get some interaction but we're not gonna do that if we don't want to ever again. Uh, Gone are the days where education will be simply given primarily with people in school. The ability to close gaps in education, the ability for teachers to see the power and the positivity of technology to enable them to be the best they can be and the students to be the best they can be has fundamentally changed. Whether it's natural resources, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's name the industry, it's been profoundly, indelibly impacted. And I, I, I think society will see more change in the next 10 years than the previous 50 years combined. Hmm. Okay, so a lot to unpack there, Peter. Um, why don't we first take a look at education, which I know you have a passion for, uh, given your family history, which might, you might want to be able to touch upon. But, but talk to us about that, but also what you're seeing through this pandemic and learning from home. And I think so many of us recognizing that, you know, people need to be in schools, probably children for developmental reasons and the interaction. So how do you actually, uh, maybe it's a hybrid model in terms of what you're expecting to see with the use of technology in education? Well, I think the big uh, thing we're learning is, is that the ability for children to absorb information and for adults to absorb information works best where you have a primary interaction that's physical and that can be reinforced using technology. The idea that you can be 100% virtual and have the same absorption rate after a shock to a uh, a, a typical process, it's it's not viable. So we, we know that we need the physical and, you know, our data suggests that somewhere between 90 to 95% of students are anywhere between one to six months behind in their learning journey than they were prior to the pandemic. And that is a profound societal impact and it's a devastating impact. Never mind the mental health, never mind the uh, interactions of, of human beings, how we develop socially, how we develop demographically, all of those things have been upended. So we need physical, we know that, there's no question. But there's no way there's enough dollars in the entire system to completely address the gap. And so filling that gap with amazing technologies like paper, paper paper.co, one of our companies, 
where you have unlimited tutoring uh, available for entire school districts in the United States at a flat fee. And doing that and augmenting that with artificial intelligence to ensure that what they're getting tutored on is correct. It's done the right way. It's super safe. And that the outcomes for the students are meeting the objectives and the goals of the curriculum. That embedding of technology in the process is the only way we can have a brighter future. And it's why we're doubling and tripling down on companies like paper. That's fascinating, Peter, because I think that when we think about children being educated, um, depending on perhaps what school region you're in, some are better versus others, that's across the world, let alone Canada and, and the United States. So what you're talking about then is, is almost really, rather than almost standardized testing, using AI throughout the process, particularly the tutoring process to make sure um, that they're learning what they need to learn and that you can assess them all the way as opposed to at the end of the school year, they fail. Like that, that's kind of, this is the first time I'm, I'm talking about this company with you. So, and my first knowledge of it. So is that kind of what we're talking about in terms of the, the new uh, way to educate? Absolutely. It's basically saying children along the way will encounter problems with what they're learning, right? They will not be able to absorb everything. I don't care how good you are, how smart you are. 99.999% of us do not absorb everything uniformly and unilaterally. Having a support system that is viable, that is economic, but that has quality control for an entire district. So think of you know, LA County, think of these gigantic cities, these districts with students that have very diverse socioeconomic capability, very different racialized or marginalized characteristics, creating a uniformity of access to true, create true equity and to bring up all of these students, maybe not at the same rate, but have them at the end of the year to be able to be equal. I think that's a profound need and it, it, it should be a societal imperative. We should feel that this is a mandatory outcome uh, of society. And so with this company that you're invested in, just maybe give us a little bit more detail in terms of where they're at in the process of rolling this out. Is the product available right now? What's the reception amongst governments and, and school districts? Yeah, they, the company is in market right now, serving over 150 school districts, serving hundreds of thousands of students. We hope to be serving more than uh, a million students by the end of the year. And we're serving them you know, somewhere between 30 to 40% of students engage in any typical month uh, in an entire district. And being able to do that 24 seven across almost all subject matter, whether it's essays, whether it's math, whether it's history, doesn't matter. And providing that support, just that ability for the student to come back and say, I have a question. And to do that in a way that the teacher can then say, oh, this is the topics that I'm probably going to go have to go back on. These are the areas that I probably should double click on and do that in a way that is teacher friendly, union friendly, superintendent friendly. And it's a win, win, win across all stakeholders, I think, is what the true value proposition here is. And, and this is a free, just so we understand, this is a free tutorial system with AI embedded. Yes, not free. We charge oh, no. we, we yeah. charge the entire district. The district the buys district. it for yes. all students. And then for the students, it's free. Once That's the district I mean. buys it, the students use it for free. Okay. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. You've worked in the States and Canada and myself as well on Wall Street uh, and TV in Canada. Who's most interested in this? I think we're seeing a, uh, a viral interest that's exploding. I think the, you know, every district we've talked to, every district that's been able to see this in action, every district that's been able to witness it has been blown away. They've been blown away by the outcomes. They've been blown away by the, the emotion that these people feel after using it. Imagine being a student that's marginalized or, or does not have access to the resources of, of a tutor or after school support or et cetera. Imagine now being able to get that help and mm -hmm. imagine the feeling that you have after it clicks, after that light bulb moment happens and imagine that multiplied a million times. It, it, yeah. is, it is a real profound thing I think we're, we're embarking on here and we think we can dramatically alter the educational structure of the United States. Is it a Canadian or US based company? 
It's founded. both. It's, it's both. both. It started in, started in Canada, um, in Montreal, actually. But it, it, you know, its operations are almost exclusively now in the United States. Got it. Um, one thing that w- uh, blew me away is something you said at the top of the conversation, which is that given the pandemic, um, students on your calculations are one to six months behind. How do you calculate that? How do you figure that? What kind of research do you do to even determine that? So we're getting empirical data out of the hundreds of thousands of students that Paper's interacting with, and we're seeing where they should be in their journey on a curriculum basis and seeing Mm -hmm. their uh, responsiveness, their understanding or their comprehension of various units and comparing that to previous cohorts. And you can see the gaps. Uh, And the reason why we give you the range of one to six months is that it is truly district dependent. Uh, You wouldn't be surprised that the districts that are most more socioeconomically challenged, uh, the impact has been devastating. They're they're behind six months. And Mm -hmm. the districts that are, you know, a little more affluent, et cetera, they're being impacted, just not as badly. But still imagine entire groups of students, entire grades being behind by a month or more. And remember, the school year is only 10 months. So, and that catching up that month, given that all the other stuff that's going on right now, it may take years, never yeah. mind the catching up of the six months. Yeah, you, you can see that being elongated potentially, depending on how long this goes on for and, and the response. Um, when you think about the societal changes as well, you know, it's funny you mentioned banks, because I was thinking about that the other day, um, all of these, um, you know, bank, retail, or, you know, front-facing uh, structures, what's going to go on in there? How do you see that? Re-imagine. They're going to have to reimagine it. Like, I, I can see a world where more banking is done in a Starbucks than is ever done in a bank branch. So then hmm. why wouldn't you want to embrace that? Like, rather than fighting innovation and, and, you know, one of the things that I've found fascinating being back in Canada for over half a decade now versus my experience in the U.S., is Canadians can tend to be passive aggressive sometimes and come uh, from a level of hubris where, oh no, we really know what we're doing. Don't worry. Oh no, we, we, we never had this dumpster fire issue. Oh no, we're not crazy. We don't go do this stuff. And it affords us, unfortunately, some negative qualities. And it doesn't allow us to see, well, when you see innovation working and you see what the light looks like, let's embrace it. Let's not try and tell people what they should like or not like. Let's just embrace what people have come become accustomed to, because at the end of the day, the customer is always right. And right. that mentality of the customer is always right, I would say, is a profoundly un-Canadian thing. And, uh, and Canadians uh, uh, need to embrace that. Yeah. So what, what do you then envision as it relates to the financial system, banks, what, what have you? I mean, you said that people are going to be doing their banking in Starbucks. I mean, it's amazing. We're all kind of sitting at home doing a lot of our our finances, and, and certainly we saw the rise of Robinhood through the pandemic. And as of late, we've heard that um, Drake has invested in Wealth Simple. Um, maybe talk to us a little bit about which kind of financial institutions you see winning in in this going forward. But also, you know, profitability. At, at what point do some of these online financial companies have to be a little bit more profitable? Yeah. So I, I think a lot to unpack there. But let, let's start with the, at the high level. I think. What we're seeing right now, we would term as the first generation of fintech. So Robinhood and these others, they're taking existing financial products and services and they're di- digitizing them. They're not necessarily reimagining them. And what do I mean by reimagining? Imagine that your banking is seamlessly woven into applications that you use every day to manage your life. Imagine you have a personal budgeting app or your business and you're using your accounting platform and all the banking is just included. It just happens automatically or all the accounting happens automatically when you use the bank. One of our companies is called Counting Up. It's a neo bank based in the UK. It does all of your accounting and taxes if you use their bank account. So imagine at the end of every day, the end of every month, you can press a button and you know what your profit and loss statement looks like. You know all your taxes are filed. You know what your cash flow is, what your cash balance is today. You know what you can spend. You know what your employees have been spending. And you know that in two weeks, you don't have enough money for payroll. So the system offers you up a line of credit that says, wow. hey, press this button. And for a fee of X, call it two and a half percent over two weeks, all in, we'll solve this problem, no paperwork. Huh. So 
That's reimagining financial products and services. That's where we think the future is going. And stock trading. Is stock trading an activity right now because we're bored? Is stock trading going to be an activity in the future? Is wealth going to be something we're doing now because we're bored? Or is wealth going to be woven into things we do every day? And our thesis is that it's going to be woven into things we do every day. So we want to find those applications that have relevancy in financial products and services and or relevancy in AI. So the other area that we double down on is integrated AI, very specific verticalized AI that solves real problems. That's fascinating, all of that. Um, to go back to the company in the UK, that is, you know, to your point earlier, um, the customer is always right servicing the customer. If you, if you answer and align yourself with the customer and give them a solution, you win, you win the business. Um, so they basically, it sounds like recognize that companies running a business rather than them having to think and talk to their accountant, their tax guy, or this, or that is an integrated solution. All in um, one. Uh, uh, say that again. All in one. All in one. And then, and then they, they benefit on the profit side by obviously doing your banking. Um, how, how's their business looking? What kind of customer uptake do they have? Is it more towards small businesses, large businesses, or the individual? Well, we're starting right now with micro businesses. So think less than five employees, but we're going to expand. And right now in the UK, we have roughly 15,000 uh, customers. And we think we can add tens of thousands of customers a year. The adoption curve looks pretty spectacular in our view. And, and, the, and the UK market's fascinating in that the UK is roughly three times the size of Canada uh, and about a third to a quarter the size of the United States. So it's an interesting you know, in-between market between Canada and the United States, but we're learning a lot of things. And what's fascinating is, is how quickly government has embraced the idea of making tax completely integrated and digital. And you'd ask yourself, well, why would they wanna do that? Well, they would wanna do that because A, it removes the, the human error aspect. B, it removes fraud. And the yeah. reason why it removes fraud is that there's no breakage between the spend on a retail and the categorization and the ability for someone to insert or fudge or manipulate the data. And so government has actually found in the pilots that we've been running with them that they think fraud could be reduced by 20 to 30%. Just mm -hmm. think about that for a second. That's pretty spectacular. So government, rather than being afraid of this, is like, oh, dear Lord, we need this. We, we need to embrace this because, boy, this pandemic has hurt, hurt us big time in our fiscal um, uh, coffers. This helps us without having to hire 10,000 new you know, auditors that, frankly, don't create a great experience for citizens. Let's just remove all of that complexity. Let's remove all of the things that cause people pain and suffering mm -hmm. and make mm -hmm. people find delight and joy. Mm -hmm. And Peter, um, for that investment, that company, what is the um, competitive landscape in the sense that if that's the vision and that's where we all might be moving in terms of financial platforms going forward, um, you know, what's the barrier to entry? I mean, obviously it's the tech and the patents, but I would assume others can do that as well. Is there a regulatory aspect to it in, in terms of it also being a bank? How do you protect yourself? Well, they, they're in tech, there is no protection. So I will say full stop in technology. In my 20 plus year career, I can say that there is no full, full stop, full secure moat. What is uh, there is the faster you can operate, the faster you can iterate, iterate innovate, and deliver value to your customer, the less likely a customer is ever to leave. And so the only competitive advantage that we tell our portfolio companies is speed. That's mm. the only competitive advantage. Be the fastest. You don't even have to be the best. Just be the fastest. And, and, and so we double and triple down on that. In the UK, the market's interesting. It's completely open banking. Uh, it's somewhere between one to three years ahead of Canada. Um, and it, it's really showing us how systems, when they're open, can work, what are the pros and cons, and where are the, the, the traps or the regulatory um, mirages, we call them, that people get enticed by. Give us an example of that. What does that mean in terms of the UK being one to three years ahead, it's fully open versus Canada? What, what are we doing that's antiquated? I'm sure there's a few things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we don't, we, we don't have open banking in Canada. So you can't 
um, without the, the fintech and your bank or these institutions actually having relationships, you can't automatically create, uh, connect all these products. So let's say you're using Wave accounting and you want to connect your bank account, unless Wave and your bank have an agreement, that connection will break regularly because the screen scraping technology or the integration technology used by Plaid, Flinks, or all these others, it's, it's designed to break on purpose because the banks don't want to necessarily allow you to have access. Open banking mandates that that access exists and mandates that everybody has to share. So it creates a little bit of a more of a play, level playing field, but it doesn't necessarily solve all the problems as it relates to um, uh, the financial data moving seamlessly and quickly and easily. And, and so, Peter, that's more on the on the banking front. You also touched upon um, what the vision might be as it relates to uh, stock trading and wealth management being much more integrated into our lives. How do you see that playing out? And and I ask the traditional asset management companies, uh, and then everybody gets excited about more of the wealth simples. What what are you seeing occur potentially? Well, I think one thing to for everyone needs to keep in mind is that um, ETFs have been an unbelievable boom and passive investing has been an unbelievable boom. But that's only one side of the equation. Fees are only one side of the equation. Performance is going to matter. And as time uh, progresses, what a lot of these robos and a lot of these new platforms are going to have to show is that they perform over time. And not just meaningfully uh, perform, but perform in the way that was expected. Uh, you know, people buy these products, people see these products, they get sold something and the brands are going to have to stand up for that. But we want to take it a step further in that imagine a world where you as a person are getting your paycheck, you're doing your life, you're living your life, and you have advisors that are built into your system that allow you on a daily basis to say, hey, Peter, we've noticed that this is your habit. You're going to buy Starbucks for X. If you only buy one Starbucks or you, you, didn't, you don't get that muffin or you don't get that bagel, we'll add $5 to your savings account. And at the end of the month, once your savings account hits $100, we're going to invest in this mutual fund or huh. this ETF. And then we're going to report back to you on when you can retire. And we'll give you that date. And we'll say, based on how your portfolio is performing and how much you're contributing, you can retire by 63 or you can buy this house in the next two and a half years because the mortgage that you were thinking of getting at these interest rates, or you're already pre-approved. We just need to see this amount of deposit. So imagine a world where these things are woven into things that you do every day and your need to go search for it, to go fill out paperwork, to go you know, sit down in a bank and sign these things and show your driver's license. Imagine that goes away. Mm -hmm. Imagine it disappears. Right. It, tough to imagine because in part, I still really do like speaking to somebody. So if you were, well, you have children, um, start, if, if you wanted a career in the financial industry, I mean, what would you think about doing? I think if you're not providing real advice, uh, you need to rethink your career and you probably should go get a computer science degree. Um, yeah. If you can't understand the technology and you can't fundamentally unpack where these systems are going and what they need to be to solve problems and to create the light for your customer, you're going to be in a lot of problems. You're going to have a lot of problems. And what I mean by advice is we need to create a way for young people to learn from folks that have the experience, either directly or through repositories of knowledge, so that folks can become specialists and provide real advice. And by real advice, it's someone sitting down with you and saying, okay, your situation's complex. The system that was, is kicking out to you says you can't ever buy a house. Well, is that really the case? Let's sit down and let's work through and let's tweak your, your life and let's figure out maybe you can buy a condo. Maybe you can you know, change your spending habits. Maybe we can you know, take you these extra courses so your, your income levels could go higher to create mm -hmm. true advice. And, and that is the differentiation between what we call the infrastructure of banking and the infrastructure of finance and the uh, irreplaceable part of finance, the advice side, the experience. Right. Side. It's almost as though, you know, people who get career coaches, like trying to integrate their skill sets 
uh, you know, with, with what they are really trying to achieve. Um, Peter, I wonder as well, you know, when we think about, I asked you about, you know, young people going into a finance career. Um, what I what I heard or read the other day was that a lot of young people are actually not, once again, choosing finance like they did in the dot-com era, my era. Um, and instead, they're going into the cryptocurrency world, digital assets. I, I just want to get your, your thoughts on where you see that playing out. Yeah, the cryptocurrency world and the, and the distributed ledger world is so fascinating. On the one hand, I'm disappointed in myself that uh, I spent time unpacking it. I, I'm, a, I'm a self-taught programmer, went in, really, really figured out the nuts and bolts of Bitcoin, if Ether and all these other uh, ledgers. And, and unfortunately saw some big drawbacks that are coming. So one drawback on Bitcoin in particular is you can only do six transactions per second, full stop, globally, right? And, and just put that in perspective, Visa, MasterCard, and American Express process more than 200,000 transactions a second globally. So it can huh. never be a payment rail based on that construct. And when I pushed back with people who are in that world and operating companies in that world, they said, don't worry, the tech will solve that. And then I push back and say, well, actually, the cryptographic algorithms don't allow that to be solved. It actually forces you, because it's open, to have a certain amount of computing power to solve the hash. And so one of the challenges with crypto is, is that the supply of crypto is actually not limited. It's actually not finite. It's infinite because you can create another distributed ledger with a different hash function to create and solve a solution that you may be trying to solve. And so there is no one solution for the crypto world. There is no one silver bullet. NFTs is another example of an asset class that we're, we're fascinated by. We love the infrastructure side by, but is it an asset that's, that, that has stood the test of time? Like is a video clip of LeBron James doing a slam, a, a, a dunk, is that really worth 500,000 in a year, 10 years time? We don't know. And what we do know is, is that the infrastructure also, from a scaling perspective, has huge environmental impacts. Most hmm. people don't know this, but the blockchain right now consumes, the eight, it's the eighth most consuming, if it were a country, entity on the planet. And at its current trajectory, in three to four years, we'll consume more power than the United States. And so is this really a net benefit to the planet? Mm -hmm. I would argue in its current construct, it isn't. And then you'll say, well, can computing solve this? Can programming solve this? Well, no, it can't because you'd actually have to change the hash function. You'd have to change the underlying tech. Uh, otherwise, every you know, month, three, six months, whatever the time frame is when the hash function reaches its limit, you have to upgrade it and make it more difficult. And so it's continuously requiring more compute power to solve it. It's mm -hmm. just a really, really fascinating world of trade-offs. And there are benefits, but those benefits and their applicability of those benefits are still to be discovered. And its impact over the next 10 to 20 years, I think is going to be profound. So its impact, does that mean you think it will in fact stay the course and maybe Bitcoin's not a payment system, but maybe it is a store of value? Yeah. I, I, by the way, the store of value, I just don't know. I, I, if it's finite, it will be a store of value. If Cryptos are not finite. The store of value argument is going to disappear over time. So the, that question needs to be answered in the not too distant future. What I actually believe is that the ledgers, the infrastructure of, of what NFTs are, are based on, that has a great future. There's lots of scenarios where you can imagine public ledgers being used as a way to have one source of truth and ensuring that source of truth is accurate across the entire ecosystem. That vision, I truly believe in and believe it has a great, great value proposition for humanity. And Peter, what kind of companies are involved then in that ledger? Who's actually doing it right now? And if you, you know, as individuals, sometimes we can't get access to those companies because they are venture companies or accredited investors or what have you. And the components that they use might be a way to invest in. I don't know if that's an NVIDIA, an AMD, or some of the semiconductor companies, as I just mentioned, but what are some of the ways to play that? Unfortunately, a lot of these tech trends, you won't be able to truly, truly get exposure to for another five to 10 years. I mean, hmm. you, could, you, you could say, oh, you know, buy Coinbase. You could say, um, buy 
uh, you know, uh, NVIDIA, because in the data center side, it's, it's cards are one of the best in crypto mining. Uh, there's a company called Bitmain that's public in, in Asia. You could potentially buy them. There's lots of proxies, but a true group that gives you the right amount of exposure that you can understand that's mm -hmm. transparent is unlikely to be available in the public markets for the foreseeable future. And so you have to work with sophisticated asset managers and you need to get them to have exposure to venture. I will make an argument that if as an individual, you do not have exposure to venture, you're actually hurting yourself and you're hurting yourself dramatically over time, the longer you're out of venture. To me, that was the big light bulb moment is I should have been full-time in this from the beginning. When I helped found DN Capital in 2000, I should have stayed in venture and I should have been there from the beginning. The amount of value, the amount of knowledge, the amount of uh, a benefit to all stakeholders at this spectrum, when it's done right and when risk is managed is profoundly greater than anything you can get in the public markets. Hmm. Well, and it's interesting you say that because, you know, for our viewers to, to understand, you are in venture, not private equity. So no. earlier investing than private equity. Maybe describe why. Yeah, venture, you're making the following bets. You're making the bet that the technology scales and works, that the market is going to be there and that you can create a repeatable and scalable sales process and that the team can scale and evolve over time. In private equity, you're making a bet that the cash flows that the entities are generating are monetizable, packageable, secure, and potentially can grow moderately over time. It's a very different value proposition, different risk spectrum. Private equity in, the, in, the, in my world, in the alternatives world, is lower risk. Venture, much, much higher risk, potentially existential risk. To, just to be, put a fine point on it, you can lose all your money in venture. And that's mm -hmm. why going with managers that have been doing this for long periods of time, who can show that they've invested over long periods of time and have been good stewards of capital and don't have one hit out of a, out of a fund, but consistently hit doubles and triples. Those are the managers, I think, that are going to succeed over time as they create platforms that help innovation accelerate. And Peter, you know, you've mentioned a word uh, a couple of times here, which is scale. And I was talking to a uh, venture company the other week, learning about them for an, for an investment purpose. And, um, you know, scale was the word that they used. So my question to you in terms of scale, scale means money. Scale means access to money, to funding. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not right? just access to money. It's, it's, it's also the ability to sell. So um, the best form of capital is sales. And in my world, a lot of startups forget that. They think folks like me are the fuel for their growth. It's actually customers that are fuel for their growth. And that mentality and that philosophy is a key thing we do. So maybe I'll spend a second and describe yeah. what we do. So we, we have two pillars to our business that we think are truly unique at this stage. The first is, is we have a full-time data team who talks to startups every day, 20 to 30 startups every day, and have, has been doing that for over six years now. And we now track and speak to 20,000 startups across North America. And to give you a context, there's roughly 500,000 startups in North America. So at the early stage of the market, we are the Bloomberg of the venture market. We have that kind of data, that kind of access, that kind of knowledge, that kind of understanding. And so why do we do that? We do that because that then helps us understand which companies are, are, are seeing that scaling, that breakout. What is causing them to break out? What are the characteristics? And it allows us to remove a lot of the pattern bias that was reinforcing exclusion, reinforcing, uh, 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 fr frankly, radicalization and gender gentrification of an industry. And mm -hmm. so we've, we've tried to boil all of that away and, and bubble up those factors that truly, truly repeat themselves for success. And then we layer in operations teams we're the only fund that, that we're aware of that has a full-time head of talent, full-time head of systems and KPIs, and a full-time team for go-to-market, sales, marketing, product, that works with the startups to overcome all of the challenges that we consistently see, consistently see. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, yeah, and important, obviously, there's no business, there's no need for the accountant in the back room if you don't have a sale. Yeah. As my father used to say, who ran a business. 
Um, but I, but I, I want to also get your take too, though, in, in terms of the amount of money, the amount of liquidity out there, because we hear that so much in the press, um, that is searching for the next best thing, that is searching for investments. Um, and what are you seeing in terms of the interest in the venture capital world? And, and then, of course, what are the prices that you have to pay to, to buy these or buy a stake in these companies? Yeah, so I would say in 20 years, I've never seen the market so competitive and did not foresee that the pandemic would literally transform my industry and, and uh, disrupt my industry in the way it has. So borders have fallen, uh, barriers have fallen. Uh, we now see on average on our deals anywhere between five to 10 US funds competing with us on every deal. Mm -hmm. And those US funds, the vast majority of them, frankly, are willing to pay any price. And what that's created is, is that we have to educate the startup and tell them, look, yes, we're not going to pay the highest price, but here's why. Here's what we're going to do with you, because we're going to help you build this world-class company. And as we build this world-class company, we are going to all win. And you're going to win disproportionately. So to put a fine point on it, imagine we're only willing to pay 50 million. This other fund's willing to pay 100. But if we're able to add 10 to 20% of value to sales or increase sales by 10 to 20% over a three-year period, what we actually do is we actually have a, a five to 10x impact at the end. And so the startups need to understand that. Some of the more sophisticated startups obviously get it right away. Some of the newer startups, they don't get it. And that's okay. So we're, we're going we're gonna to work with those founders that, that want the help, that know they need the help, that understand that there's a repeatability and there's a scalability to venture. And then when we have the data and we have data unlike anyone else, we can help them construct the experiments they need to do to succeed. Got it. And, and Peter, when you think about, um, again, going back to your premise, it, is, it seems like how, how you approach investing in VC is the structural changes going on in society. So we've talked about finance, we've talked about AI and education. Um, what about healthcare? Um, is that an area that's been a focus, is a focus? How's that changed over the past year? Yeah, so healthcare is, is one of deep interest to us, and we're actually going to be recruiting more and more talent in that area. I'm a firm believer that you have to have experience, you have to have knowledge, and you have to have a deep level of understanding, and you can't be superficial. And healthcare is one of those areas being superficial can really hurt you really quickly, and, and you may not have an ability to manage risk. So one of the things that we believe strongly is, is that we have to know the risks that we're willing to accept. And we have to know that these are the un unidentifiable risks that we're unaware of. And in healthcare, specifically pharma, that's an area of expertise we do not have. And so we do have an area of expertise in digital transformation in healthcare. So think records, think delivery models, think systems in and around healthcare. That is an area that we're deeply interested in. We haven't made an investment in this fund yet, but we've looked at a lot. But it's an area that we think is going to be transformed in an area where AI is going to have such a dramatic impact. And, and the vaccination program of COVID is a great example of it. There is no way we could have developed the vaccines as quickly as we did without AI. Would not have happened. Most people don't know this, but Moderna, um, AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer, the amount of machine learning data scientists they have on their teams is breathtaking. Thousands of people. And, and so you're not just talking about chemists. You're talking about people that are modeling chemical compounds and doing machine learning on ribonucleic acid and, and you know DNA uh, strands and trying to figure out how these molecules potentially interact. That's not an area that I have expertise in or nor anyone else on our team, but we're going to recruit for that. But an area where we think, again, that we can add value is, is how that data is transformed, how that data is utilized, how that data is leveraged how AI is used in that area. It's an area that we're pretty excited about. You know, the one question, of course, that pops up when we think about AI and data uh, is privacy. What issues do you see there in terms of stopping some of this progress or moving forward that you're talking about? It's breathtaking, the privacy, complexity, data issues that are gonna face us as a country, uh, as society, as the Western world, as the Eastern world, as, as, as a planet and as a species. 
And the one thing I would say is, is that most people spend more time worrying about this, but without understanding what that real risk is and that real benefit, cost benefit is. And I think one thing to understand is, is that if we as individuals are given transparency on how our data is used, you will find that based on age, people have a different risk tolerance. And I can tell you that people under the age of 30 are very willing to give up a disproportionate amount of data versus someone like myself. And so I would argue that it's very, very, very tough for governments to create a one size fits all strategy. Mm -hmm. And we will devastate and we will, we will destroy our tech sector if we try that. And countries such as China that don't have those issues will become the dominant superpower in tech if we do mm -hmm. that. If we continue a path where everything is locked down and no data shared and privacy means literally nothing is able to move, then you can see a world in 20 years where tech is dominated by Chinese multinationals. Hmm. Speaking of tech in Canada, um, a Waterloo-based company went public the other day. Magnet Apparently, Forensics. Pardon? Magnet Forensics. Yes. Apparently, that's the first Canadian tech IPO in 15 years. In Waterloo, yeah. First in one Waterloo. In Waterloo. Yeah, first one in Waterloo in 15 years. It's pretty phenomenal. Unbelievable, great group of companies. Um, they are what I would call data specialists, privacy specialists, super sleuths, AI for solving crimes, solving um, privacy issues, piracy uh, they are one of the world leaders, pretty phenomenal. We, we actually tried to invest in them uh, several years ago. I uh, couldn't get in. They were growing so fast. They didn't end up taking any capital. Hmm. But does it surprise you at all that it's one in 15 years or the Waterloo area? I mean, I'm, I guess my question really is, where do we stack up these days? We, we talk so much if you're talking to Canadians about how great we are in tech, which I'm sure we are, but a lot of the companies also go to the United States. They kind of leave Canada a little bit of a brain drain there. Uh, and, you know, to only see one IPO in 15 years at a Waterloo, is that not a bit disappointing? It's hugely disappointing. It should be a massive wake up call to everybody. One of the things that Canada is really great at is building world class technology. I feel confident in saying that we are world class at tech, but we're not world class is at sales. We suck at sales in general. Uh, and yes, there are exceptions. And yes, there's wonderful salespeople in Canada. And yes, there's great marketers. But in a generalized way, and the data holds this, U.S. companies sell first, then build. Canadian mm. companies build first, then sell. And that dichotomy uh, creates what I call an impetus for capital, um, uh, what, what we call continuous capital sustainment. And the best, I go back to my comment, the best capital is revenue. It's self-sustaining. It's recurring it's reinforcing and it provides you data on how your product's doing. The worst kind of capital is capital from folks like me. We are not recurring. We are not self-sustaining. We don't provide you that immediate feedback in the same way. And I think there's too much focus on uh, making sure there's enough venture capital, et cetera, not enough focus on sales. And I think that bears out. And one of the, the lessons that governments and policymakers should, should do is that every time there's a policy that sounds really good and sounds very populist and, you know, is going to get you elected, it might actually dramatically impact negatively the country and might dramatically negatively impact society for mm -hmm. decades. And these profound butterfly effects, we call them, are just so fearful on how people are, are, are creating policy, not understanding it and not appreciating the world which we live in today. Mm -hmm. and, and the competitive landscape to your point earlier about China. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna divert for one second and then we'll get to, because people know you also as a uh, Wall Street analyst, I wanna get your kind of big, big picture take on a couple of stocks. Um, but having said what you just said from a policy perspective and how important that is, open court here, uh, when you think about the policies being implemented in Canada right now, and it can be water, it can be pipelines, it can be tech, it can be um, the internet of things uh, and restricting things there, maybe. Um, what, what's front and center for you? What do you want to see? What do you want to see change? What do you want to see not happen? 
Yeah, so um, I think some context is important. My family are refugees from the Soviet bloc, and we're we're naturally fearful of big government. Um, mm. Everybody has this view right now, and there's a wide view in Western world that government is safe, it's nice, it's friendly, it's got your best interests at heart. Um, my family watched the government mutate uh, to a, a massive societal harm, and it enslaved its people for over 50 years, and it dictated um, who uh, was successful and who, who wasn't successful simply on people's willingness to be part of a party. And it is the same coin, just a different side to, to fascism, to Nazism. And, and, and I say this as a warning to people who become enamored with very large governments. There needs to be a balance. Uh, we need an equal start for everyone, hence my passion for education. We need an equal and level playing field for everyone. Uh, but we need to also understand that when government's regulating speech and regulating content, that is a dangerous slope. Whether you like what people are saying or not, and there's a lot of things I, I see that I don't like, I become terrified um, living through what, what, what my family lived through. There were, there were times where family members were put in jail for the simple thing of saying, I don't agree. Imagine mm -hmm. saying the words, I do not agree, and being put in prison. That is what happened in the Soviet bloc. And, and people today, because the Soviet bloc is you know, gone 30 plus years now, they don't see it. They don't know that it's real, that this stuff can happen, and they don't see the dangers. And then, you know, you, you hear people say things like, well, deficits don't matter. You know, that kind of thinking without a historical context or without an educational framework or an understanding is super dangerous. And it can lead to explosive hyperinflation. And mm -hmm. the end result, the risk to the system is so profound what happens if a government of Canada auction fails? What happens? We don't, we don't get the money. We and then what happens if we don't get the money? What Our dollar goes down. Oh, no, it's much worse than that. They can't even pay the bills. Suddenly right. now, there is no ability to pay bureaucrats. There was a time in the 90s, again, a long time ago now, where the finance minister, um, Minister Manley, had to face the failed auction. And there was payroll issues in Canada. And mm -hmm. those kinds of things people just don't seem to want to remember. They yeah. have a fantasy that there's a free lunch. They have a fantasy that governments can spend perpetually with impunity. And that just doesn't work. And, and yeah. then the reverse is, is, oh, we can tax our way back to things. People, talented people will only work in areas where they feel it's a fair trade-off. Mm -hmm. I think most professionals today, educated professionals, feel that they should contribute, feel that there is a need to all of us to put pool our resources to ensure society is fair and to ensure that we all benefit. But at some point, there's a tipping point. And if you're working for the government, and I use that term completely and truly, it's no longer fair. And we see that now with... Um, senior executives, when we try and recruit them to Canada, they no longer come. Yeah. And now because of Zoom, they can work remotely. And so now instead of getting 50 cents of their tax dollars, we're getting zero. And so now those professional people that would be working here in Canada and contributing to our society, working for Canadian tech companies are now contributing zero. Yeah, I know. And, and the, the problem is that people don't realize it. They think, oh, we'll just get more and more of their money. It's not happening. They're leaving. They can do no one, it. No, one no who's one's talented, coming. No one who's talented is going to put up with a, a perpetual tax increase. No one's going to put up with it. At some point, people say, as much as I love this country, it no longer loves me back. Absolutely. And, and so, Peter, when we think about what we're kind of talking about, too, in terms of um, controlling content, we're talking about the Trudeau proposal for B, uh, Bill C-10. What, what do you think Canadians should really understand about that? I think every Canadian should just really read that bill. Every Canadian should ask themselves, is it right for unelected officials to decide what 
content is good or bad. And everyone needs to ask themselves that. And look, there's a lot of people on the internet that I just think are racist, fascist, awful human beings. Mm -hmm. And I believe I shouldn't read them. I believe nobody should read them. But I don't believe the right answer is censorship. Mm -hmm. Unless you're harming somebody, unless you're causing riots or you're like the, the, the capital riots, unless you're doing things like that, and there is hate speech, obviously, there is a line. You, you, you can't censor. Like you, you, there has to be freedom of speech because there has to be an ability to object. There has to be an ability to, uh, for people to voice their concern with any government policy with, without impunity. Like there, there has to be impunity. You cannot be harmed for the ability to say, I don't agree. The moment people are being fined or imprisoned, for saying simple things like, I don't agree. And really those words, we're not talking inflammatory words. We're not talking yeah. words, literally, I don't agree. That's when you know it's too late. Mm -hmm. Or I'm pushing back on the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that. And, and Peter, just stepping back again, taking a look at the public equity markets, Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, where do you see some of these companies going? I mean, they seem to be the the largest ones and in charge, large and in charge. Yeah, so I think um, the the markets are are trading off here now. The sell in May is in full swing. I actually am fundamentally bullish. I think yeah. the economy is going to boom in the second half of the year at well above consensus rates. What we're seeing in our data is the economy is accelerating and not accelerating at slow rates. We're talking going from six and a half percent kind of growth rates to 10 plus percent. I don't remember in my lifetime seeing the US economy grow 10% plus ever on an annualized basis. And, and so we're seeing something that hasn't happened in 50 plus years. That kind of demand, that kind of infrastructure spending, that kind of profound impact across the economy. Just ask yourself a simple question. Are companies that are growing at that rate gonna buy more or less tech? And the simplest answer is they're gonna buy more. Well, what kind of tech are they gonna buy? Well, they're gonna buy smartphones and tablets. So Apple's gonna win. They're gonna buy cloud services. So we know Amazon and Microsoft are gonna win. They're gonna buy security. So you're gonna want to security companies. Entrepreneurs are gonna explode. So Shopify is gonna crush it. We know there are these secular companies that are riding these secular waves that you just gotta own. And, and you got to own for long periods of time and not worry about the daily fluctuations. The, the flip side of this argument, though, is, is that the central banks are probably going to be forced to put on the brakes much sooner than they realized, much sooner than the public expects. And hmm. inflation, there's a real risk of hyperinflation for the first time in my lifetime uh, in North America. I, there's hmm. a real risk. The lumber market is a great example. Uh, it's obviously exacerbated by huge demand pull, but we're seeing inflationary dislocations happen in flare-ups. But what happens if the general price expectation is, is that, oh, 5% price increases are normal. Then you're back to the 70s where inflation expectations get out of hand. Mm -hmm. what, what's your personal best way to fight against hyperinflation? Because I, I love the fact that that's out of consensus in terms of the word hyper. People are even just talking about inflation. You're saying hyper. How do you want to invest in that scenario? Hard assets, hard assets. Pick your hard assets, whether it's stocks, whether it's um, real estate, um, whether it's private equity, whether it's venture, um, whether it's um, precious metals, um, hard assets is the best way to protect. And your portfolio should have that. The one category that's most at risk in that is the fixed income market, the bond market. The dislocation that I think there's a real chance could occur is profound. And, and here's the, 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 the pullback to, to our previous topic. It could cause governments to have to pay triple to quadruple the interest rates they pay right now. And just to put the fine point on that, Canada is paying somewhere between 10 to 20% of its budget on interest payments. If it quadruples, more than half of our spending has to be just to service the debt. Imagine that happens. Imagine. Yeah. That, that's the budget. 
if, if the rates go up. Um, Peter, we will leave it there. This has been an incredible conversation, a fascinating conversation. All of this, of course, is, you know, tweeted out, as you know, it's on my YouTube, but it's also a podcast. So I hope and think this is something great for people to kind of listen to as they're walking, exercising, something. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I hope we can do it again. Thanks for having me, Catherine. Great to see you. Thank you. You too.